Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation. I am Nikki Bell with the Alumni Association's Engagement Team, and it's exciting to have you join us here to celebrate the Forever Club reunion. We extend a special welcome to all of our members of the classes of 1970 and 1971 with us today. We hope you will enjoy the session and hear from a hear a few NC State pride points that you can share with your friends in your home and community. Before I present our speaker, I want to thank our guests who are members of the Alumni Association for your membership. Membership dues support the Alumni Association operations and help fund the programming we offer just like this reunion. And now I will turn this presentation over to our guest speaker, Dr. Gower. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I'm pleased to be able to share some ideas about sustainable forest carbon management today with the audience. Um, I did my master's here uh, long ago and uh, returned as department head and stepped down recently as department head and, and now the Jordan Family Distinguished Professor for Natural Resources Innovation. So uh, I am going to try to share the screen. And that should do it, I hope. Can everyone see that? Not Nikki, does, can you see that? Not yet, it's still on you. Um, can you try it one more time? Mm-hmm. Okay, it says that you've started your screen sharing, but nothing's populated yet. There we go. Yeah. Is it up? It's up. We're good. Okay. Um, I can't see it. I know it may be bandwidth issues here. Um, I see someone else has entered. Um, if Nikki, if you'll let people in from the waiting room, that would be great. And I'll just get yes, started. Sir. Okay, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. So my goal for the audience is to provide them with first principles of carbon cycle science that they can use to critically uh, review um, scientific articles, popular articles, news media clips. Um, and I've gone ahead and given you a little teaser for the end of the seminar on biofuels. That has recently been in the news, at least in North Carolina, a lot. There was a publication and probably the most prestigious um, journal there is in the world, Science, written by the former dean of the Nicholas School of Environment, and he shared his views on biofuels. So I, my goal is after this, most of this talk today, then you will be well informed and understand the basic first principles of um, carbon cycle science. So I thought it'd be fun before we get started if uh, you might uh, answer this survey question, I've sprinkled the seminar with little quiz questions. I thought it'd be interesting to understand how you view your competence in uh, forest carbon cycles and potential role as biofuels. So you can either click excellent or very good or poor, and we'll do this reassessment um, shortly after or at the end of the, the seminar. Okay, I think while that's going, uh, we've got a lot of people in the good category and one in the poor category. So we'll see if we can improve that uh, at the end. So I'm gonna end the poll and keep moving on. So here's what I hope to cover today. Um, I thought I would first get started and talk about what the difference between biomass and carbon is and then briefly talk about forest and the global carbon cycle. And then um, 
where I think the real interesting part of this is scientifically is talk about how forest carbon cycles change as forests grow, and then talk about two case studies, and then finish up with woody biomass and save time for questions at the end. So this slide is the only chemistry slide that I'm gonna show. And one of the things that I like about, I consider myself a forest ecosystem ecologist, is I have to be versed in all kinds of disciplines, chemistry, physics, micrometeorology, ecology, and even computer science, as you'll see, I use models quite a bit to, um, to do my analysis. Okay, so I thought I'd start off with the most simple carbon model there is. And I wanna emphasize there are three pools, the atmosphere, the vegetation, and the soil. And there's about three or four fluxes in the most simple depiction of our terrestrial carbon cycle. Uh, the vegetation removes CO2 from the atmosphere and uh, then the plants actually respire part of that CO2 back out to the atmosphere. And then as plants die or shed parts, that becomes detritus or dead leaves, dead roots, even the whole tree if it's blown over, and that eventually becomes soil carbon. And then as the fungi and the bacteria break down the organic matter in the soil, it releases CO2 back to the atmosphere. So that's our very simplest version of a carbon model. And a point that I wanna make early on is I think uh, our forest ecologists and politicians and earth system scientists need to think about both the strategies for carbon storage in forest and carbon sequestration. And as we get into the lecture, I hope that difference between storage and sequestration becomes a bit clearer. So this is a slightly out, to, out of date global carbon cycle uh, model or image. And I'll call your attention to the three pools that I've circled in red, green, and blue, or red, green, and yellow. The atmosphere contains about 750 gigatons of carbon. That's more than the vegetation, which is about 610 gigatons. But the point that I really want to draw your attention to is the soil contains almost 1600 gigatons of carbon. So it actually exceeds the combination of vegetation and soil or vegetation and atmosphere carbon. So you could imagine a small change in the flux rate of that soil carbon pool can have pronounced impacts on atmospheric CO2 concentration. I also highlighted and circled uh, dash things, the flux from the soil and the flux from the vegetation. And we'll get into more of that um, as we proceed. So I thought it would be useful to give you a map of the biomes of the world. What I've tried to do is with that red box, highlight all the forest biomes of the world um, and coated them in green, some kind of shade of green. So it helps you visualize the extent of the forest biomes of the world. Um, I also thought it might be interesting um, I've highlighted with those red arrows where my primary research has taken place over the last three decades, largely when I was at University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I've worked in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, Sweden, Northern Siberia, and Northeast China. So our first or our next poll question is, Based on this graph, what percentage of the Earth's land surface do you think is covered by forest? So if people will participate in that poll um, and make your best guesstimate as to what it is. Okay, we've got uh, the leading uh, answers are 30% and 50%. And for those who said 30%, they are correct. It's a little deceiving, I think, but the yellows tend to make you think that's forest, but it's 
And I'm, I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. So here's the same map, only this time I've mapped carbon content and that includes the vegetation plus the soil. And I think you can see the darker, the intensity, like the blues and the dark greens, that's higher carbon content. So our tropical forests are, are major uh, stores of carbon, as are the boreal forest. The difference being the boreal forest, most of that carbon is in peat, um, often frozen in the permafrost. So I've asked the same question, what percentage of the total vegetation carbon content is contained in forest? So you, this is your next question. Okay, I'm not seeing that one come up. Here we go. Total carbon. Okay, we've got a few answers. So those who said 45% they are correct and the point being that forests contain a disproportionately larger amount of carbon than the area right we said that was about 30 percent and we've got 45 percent of the total vegetation carbon being in forest so that means it's a major player in our global carbon cycle so I'm going to switch gears a little bit now, and we're going to talk about fluxes. And uh, having taught forest ecology at Wisconsin for 30 some odd years, um, I know this can be a little confusing. So I'm going to go through it slow, but I will say that this is a critical part of the seminar is to understand this difference between storage and sequestration. So the first flux that I want to talk about is gross primary photosynthesis. So that is the vegetation removing the carbon from the atmosphere. And then the second associated flux is autotrophic respiration. So that is CO2 respired back to the atmosphere by the plants. The difference between your gross primary photosynthesis and autotrophic respiration is net primary production. That's the organic matter that's stored in all the parts of the tree. Then a really critical flux is heterotrophic respiration. So this is the CO2 that's released from the soil as fungi and bacteria break down the organic matter. So that's an input back to the atmosphere. And finally, the difference between net primary production and heterotrophic respiration defines whether the ecosystem is a carbon sink or a carbon source. So if the forest is storing carbon, that arrow is downward and it uh, is serving as a sink. If heterotrophic respiration exceeds net primary production, then the ecosystem is a carbon source and releasing a net amount of CO2 to the atmosphere. So this net ecosystem production is a really, really important index of whether any terrestrial ecosystem is a carbon sink or a carbon source. So there's different ways that we can measure this. You can actually go out and measure the growth of individual trees and understories. And in this case, this is a boreal forest, the sphagnum and the feather moss. They actually take up more carbon than the trees do in these uh, high latitude boreal or taiga forests. The other approach are these eddy flux towers. This is a micrometeorological approach. Uh, you've got a second view from the top of the tower downward. And you see in the center there, the 3D anemometer that measures wind speed in every direction. It's uh, sampling air for both moisture and uh, CO2. And with very uh, complicated models, 
you can actually estimate the exchange of carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and the footprint of these towers, which is typically several acres, um, depending on how tall the tower is. So um, we've talked a little bit about sort of a static situation, and now I want to talk about or adding time into the equation, which makes it very interesting from a scientific standpoint, but it also makes it very complicated when people start asking questions about biofuels and what's going on. So the way ecologists study how forests change during succession or as they get older is we use an experimental design called chronosequences. And this slide is a Manitoba, Canada wildfire chronosequence. That top slide it occurred about one month after the wildfire was uh, put out. And then you've got about a 10 year old stand, a 20 year old stand, and that 20 year old stand, you now have almost three to four feet of suspended tree stems that have now fallen over. Um, it takes that long for them to fall over. And then you got a 40 year old stand and the one on the far left is about a 120 year old black spruce boreal forest. It's got a uh, semi permafrost in it and a very nice coating or ground cover of sphagnum and feather moss. Here's another example. This is in Saskatchewan. This is a logging chrono chrono sequence. This is jack pine. I just thought I'd give you a little flavor for what these chrono sequences look like. So there was a very famous paper in 1969 by the famous ecologist Eugene Odom at University of Georgia, and he hypothesized what each of these three fluxes would look like through stand development or succession. So the green is net primary production. Remember, that's a downward flux of vegetation taken up carbon. The red line is the heterotrophic respiration. That's the CO2 that's released by the fungi and the bacteria. And then the blue line is the difference between NPP and heterotrophic respiration. Unfortunately, we didn't really have the technologies to actually test these, this central hypothesis to carbon dynamics. But over time, as we've developed uh, these eddy flux towers and portable gas exchange analyzers, we've been able to really test this idea. So these, to my knowledge, are the only five complete forest chrono sequences in the world. On the x-axis, you've got stand age, and on the y-axis, you've got net ecosystem production. So just a reminder, if that number is negative, then the forest is a carbon source. It's releasing CO2 to the atmosphere. If it's positive, the forest is taking up carbon. So you can see every one of these forests, uh, they have different life expectancies, but every one of them follow the same pattern of large CO2 losses immediately following the disturbance, whether that's wildfire or logging. It reaches a maximum carbon sink strength fairly early on in the life of the stand, and then it drops and oscillates around zero in the mature or old growth stands. I think it's very fascinating where some of these towers ran for six or 10 years to look at the interannual variation in these old growth forests. But if you take the average, they're all right around zero in these old growth stands. The maximum sequestration occurs very early in the life of the stand. So I wanted to do two more quizzes after that little part of the discussion to gauge the um, audience and whether they're following along. So the first is a true false, and that is mature or old growth forests store a large amount of carbon. Okay, I think we only have two participants, so I think we've got our results. So it is true that mature forests store large amounts of carbon. 
and I capitalize that. Now the second question, true or false, mature old growth forests sequester a large amount of carbon. Okay, so that's good. So I, I believe the audience fully understands and it's not an easy concept the difference between storage and sequestration. Storage is the accumulation, obviously, of many, many years. Sequestration is just that annual flux that's taken place. All right, let me get back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so um, I would now want to look at landscape patterns. What we've, sh what I just showed you, were individual stands, but we know the forest landscape. Um, is made up of different patches of forest and different ages of forest. But before I do that, I thought I'd give you a little insight into how people like myself try to estimate carbon exchange with the atmosphere over large spaces. So we typically use an ecosystem process model. That's what's depicted here. Um, notice the patchwork and heterogeneity of different forest types or even different vegetation types and ages of the forest. So the model uses remotely sensed data or spatial data as input into the uh, ecosystem process model. I've given you some examples of the spatial data sets that we pull into the model. Um, most of these models simulate simultaneously carbon, water, and nutrients. And the reason we do that is those cycles um, interact. So you can imagine in an extreme drought situation, photosynthesis is shut down due to the lack of water. So it's, it's really critical that these ecosystem process models account simultaneously for carbon, water, and nutrients. Okay, so let's take a look at two case studies. And I picked these case studies out um, because they have different outcomes. And at first it seems like it doesn't make sense, but in fact, it actually does. And the point that I'll make later is it highlights why it's really dangerous to make a uniform or blanket statement about biofuels. So this is, uh, a MODIS image down in the lower right corner. MODIS is the most recent satellite launched by NASA. It does daily coverage at a one by one kilometer grid. And all the pink and the red depicts recent wildfires up in Thompson, Manitoba. If any of you have been to Thompson, it's where you catch the train overnight to go into Churchill and see the polar bears. Um, it's all boreal forest and the paved road ends in Thompson, Manitoba. So here's a histogram showing the area burned for Saskatchewan and Manitoba. These are two of the central provinces in Canada. The point being fire frequency and extent have dramatically increased in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And so we asked the question, well, what impact does that have on carbon dynamics or carbon exchange between the boreal forest and the atmosphere. Boreal forests are the second largest biome in the world. So they are really important in our global carbon cycle. So we ran four different model scenarios for a thousand by thousand kilometer grid centered on uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan. And one scenario was simply using historic climate data uh, up to the current and project how the forest responds to interannual and interdecadal uh, changes in climate. The second scenario, we accounted for CO2 effects on photosynthesis. The third is we incorporated the fire maps or the fire frequency, the area extent into the model and then the fourth scenario is we included all four scenarios in sort of the the final model run so on the bottom graph that's again just the area that burned uh by year and on the top 
That is your carbon exchange. I've called it net biome production. That's just carbon sink versus carbon source. If it's negative, the system is serving as a carbon source. It's releasing CO2 to the atmosphere. If it's positive, it's a carbon sink. So you can see uh, the meteorology. You see large interdecadal patterns of up and down. Uh, but if you add all that up, it's basically sort of slightly positive, maybe a third of a ton of carbon per hectare per year. The climate change effects seem to increase uh, the efficiency of water use, which is what we expect. The one that I really want to call your attention to is that red line. So when you account for all the area that's burned, the emissions, and remember, go back to those NEP curves I showed you for an individual stand, immediately after a disturbance, be it logging or wildfire, there's this large loss of CO2 until the vegetation recovers. And so what this model suggests, um, and it's been substantiated now in other parts of the boreal region, is with increased fire frequency, the boreal forest has switched from a weak carbon sink, that is, it was taking up carbon and storing it from the atmosphere to a weak carbon source. So it has switched from a sink to a source due to increased fire frequency. And again, that's happening worldwide in the Siberian forest. It's happening in the Rocky Mountains with drought and insect attack and then followed by wildfire. So this is a fairly common pattern that, that we've seen. Okay, case study number two. This was when I was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Schwamiga Nicolay National Forest is a fairly large uh, national forest. It's also a fairly uh, large provider of wood um, because of these productive pine forests and northern hardwood forests. It's got a very interesting history. At the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s, a lot of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan were all clear-cut by the early settlers uh, to meet the demand for timber in the growing areas of Chicago, but also to try to clear the land for farming. So these are a couple of historic photos uh, from that era. So we used the same model, parameterized it for uh, northern hardwoods, and what you see here is X on the x-axis time, we went back to historic uh, 1850s and ran the model forward. The bottom part of the histogram, that's the area that was uh, conifers and hardwoods that were harvested. We went back to historic records in many of the townships and recreated the harvest records. Then we started the model off. And again, on the y-axis, that's net uh, carbon sequestration or net biome production. Negative, it's a source positive, it's a sink. And so it's sitting there, these old growth forests were basically had a zero uh, carbon strength, which is what we've already seen. Then as you start the harvesting, it turns into a carbon source. That's about, you know, in that area right there. And then as the forests recover, it becomes a very strong carbon sink. But I'll call your attention that at the end, um, it's starting to drop, okay? So that prompted us to ask another question. So there's just an analogy of what's going on, is we took the model and said, well, what if we, our sole objective is to maximize carbon sequestration? And so we did many simulations on the x-axis, you have percent area harvested of the Schwamiga Nicolay forest. Currently, it's being harvested at about point, a half of one percent of the area is harvested annually. They could, they have an allowable cut up to two percent, but every time a harvest request is put in, there's environmental groups that uh, submit litigation and stop the harvest. Uh, we ran the model out for 100 years. That's on the y-axis time period. And again, this net biome production or carbon sink strength 
um, is on the z-axis. So the red line marks our current um, harvesting regime, and you can see it's still sequestering carbon. There's that with a, a half of one percent allowable cut, um, and I've explained why that doesn't happen. But you can see the maximum sequestration occurs at about a two to two and a half percent allowable cut each year. And so you actually can increase net sequestration by 30% when you go from a half of 1% area harvest to a two and a half percent area harvest. So I'm guessing people might find that both interesting and a little confusing, but I'll go back to our conceptual diagram and try to explain why in these two case studies, we saw two different responses. And I think we can explain it um, and it demonstrates the importance of age structure across landscapes. So here's our conceptual model. For our first scenario, the boreal forest, it's always burned. Um, it has a fire return interval of anywhere to 10 to 20 years. But what we saw with warmer climates is increased fire frequency. So starting off somewhere on that NEP curve, maybe at a slightly lower than maximum, with increased fire frequency, you're pushing the landscape down to the left of that curve uh, to the point where it ended up being negative, okay? In contrast, our northern hardwood forest, if you go back and look at that, remember I pointed out it reached a maximum of a, but was starting to decline. So what happens when you increase the average, or I should say you decrease the average age of the stand for the landscape, the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest, that pushes the average NEP back up toward its maximum. So you have two different forest systems with two very different age class structures across the landscape. And you can see how a disturbance affects each of these very differently as far as a carbon sink or a source. So that's quite critical, especially as we start now talking about um, biofuels. So I thought I would use this as a transition over to our last topic of, of biofuels. Um, this is CO2 emissions. Um, and I added two uh, interesting dates. Uh, I got my PhD in 1987 and became a distinguished professor in 2020. I think that's 34 years if my math is correct. And it's really amazing when you look at how CO2 of emissions have changed during that 34 years of my professional career. So I asked the, a quiz question, sort of what's the approximate increase in atmosphere CO2 concentration in the last 34 years? And I'll, I'll remind you what I showed you was emissions, not CO2 concentration. So this may be a little misleading Basically, I'll give you a hint. We went from about 365 to about 405 during that time, parts per million in the atmosphere. So the, the right answer is actually 12%, plus or minus, uh, you know, depending upon what the current estimate of atmospheric CO2 concentration is. So that's, you know, the, for the emissions to, increase dramatically in atmosphere CO2 concentration to increase 12% in, in 34 years is, um, it's pretty daunting, but that is really the basis for this next topic, and that's woody biomass bioenergy. And uh, pardon the pun, but there couldn't be a hotter topic environmentally in North Carolina, if you are familiar with the company in Viva, They've come in and set up a number of uh, pellet mills, and there's quite a bit of controversy whether this is good or bad. So what I'm trying to do here to close the seminar 
is draw upon that basic car first principles of carbon cycle science you've now mastered and help us have an informed discussion uh, simply from the standpoint of whether these wood chips or wood pellets are environmentally friendly. We're gonna ignore the biodiversity issues, uh, social economic benefits or lack thereof, and just focus on um, our wood pellets, are they carbon friendly? So I'll remind you that when we start talking about products, the system becomes a bit more complicated. We've got a biological ecosystem and an industrial ecosystem that we have to account for. So I think a good place to start for this discussion is how are wood resources changing in the Southeast over the recent uh, decades? And this graph simply shows the percent um, of forest acreage in these four or five major forest types. So we've got in the royal blue or the light blue, I should say, that's pine plantations. Um, the orange is or natural pine stands. The largest forest type in the southeast are upland hardwoods, uh, somewhat underutilized. And then we've got mixed pine hardwoods and then lowland hardwoods. So my point being is pine plantations only comprise about 24% of the forest area in the Southeast, the dominant one being the upland hardwoods. So this is a historic perspective of merchantable volume by hardwoods, softwoods, and planted. And the thing that should jump out to you here is the amount of volume or biomass or carbon that is accumulating in pine plantations simply because the acreage has really changed during this time period. This graph shows you by those five major forest types, it compares growth versus removal by harvest. And you can look at each one and for every one of these forest types, the growth exceeds the harvested area. So uh, some people find it very surprising that our forests are growing in area and in biomass um, over time. And there actually is a modest conversion of agriculture over the forest by investors because of a greater return on investment. So that sort of finalizes my presentation. I guess the last point that I wanted to make is if you go back to our understanding and discussion of net ecosystem production and landscapes, clearly our southeastern forests are growing in size and there is a I won't call it a surplus, but the growth sanding volume exceeds that's harvested. So if there is an area in the world where growing forests for woody biomass pellets makes sense, it's probably here in the Southeast. So I thought it would be fun to maybe go back and revisit and see, let you reassess your understanding of the forest carbon cycle um, and its potential role as biofuel source. And hopefully this information sort of allows you to read things a bit more critically uh, that we see in the popular news and on radio and TV stations all the time. So with that, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. I think we still have time. Uh, Dr. Gower, I have a question. Have, let's see, here's a chat. Yes, sir. Uh, you had a chart that showed CO2 emissions with, with your graduation dates and your receiving distinguished uh, professorship. Uh, that graph seemed to have a, a takeoff point. Um, and I didn't catch the date, but it was uh, before you received your degree. Do you, you know what happened? along about then that suddenly caused the CO2 emissions to start to greatly increase? Yeah, most of those uh, 
global CO2 emissions are driven by transportation and energy. And so what you're seeing is probably um, more transportation, certainly in the US, but the industrialization of a number of countries such as India and China and Russia, and that's what's really contributing to this rapid rise in CO2 uh, concentration. I don't know if anybody saw in the news last week, or maybe it was early part of this week, China now surpassed, their emissions surpassed the sum of all the developed countries. So, you know, as China comes online and industrialization, and as India comes online with industrialization, um, truthfully, it's only gonna get worse before it ever gets any better. Does that answer your question? Yes, it did, thank you. Yes, sir. Dr. Gower, this is Albert Coffey. Could you possibly address- How are you today? I'm fine, how are you? Good. Um, could you possibly address the uh, uh, carbon, equation as it relates to, to pine plantations that are managed and, and thinned all the way up to age 35 to 45, as opposed to just those that are harvested for uh, pellets? Um, I, I can try. Um, are we talking a specific, like individual stand or the landscape for Southeast US? Well, let's just take an individual uh, tree farm yeah, and, uh, and one that, so, that an individual manages, say 40, 50 acres of pine plantation with three, three thinnings right. and then a final harvest at maybe age 40. Uh, how, do, how, does that, sure. how does that shake out in terms of carbon sequestration? Um, it would likely reach a maximum and um, right around the first thinning and foresters are, are pretty, pretty savvy about this. They, they know growth rates. Um, so what you would likely see is a peak, uh, then drop a slight amount for a short period of time, two or three years um, as the canopy refills. And so you might get sort of a jagged upward and downward trend, but uh, you probably would around our typical rotation age, of uh, let's say anywhere from 25 to 40, depending on your products, um, you're probably keeping that forest close to its maximum carbon sequestration capacity with those few interruptions followed, you know, for several years after a thinning. So uh, foresters are pretty darn good at both maximizing growth and sequestering carbon. Does that help? Thank you. Yes, I think that answers my question. Any other question? Well, I enjoyed visiting with you and your interesting questions and hopefully you've have a little bit better understanding now the first principles of carbon cycle science. Uh, we're gonna continue to see lots of discussion on the wood pellet industry and the role it's playing in, uh, in the Southeast. Thank you so much, Dr. Gower. We really appreciate having you do the presentation for us today. And now that we've come to an end, we will be emailing out the recordings for all of our reunion programming in case anyone would like to check out ones that you may have missed. As we start to plan for a return to our in-person alumni gatherings, the Alumni Association will continue to provide some virtual programming going forward. You can keep an eye out on our website at the Alumni Association or email us for more information. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a good day.